This lecture is on pyramid schemes, multi-level marketing, and Ponzi schemes for Philosophy G115 at Golden West College. The main sources and text that we're using that this uh, lecture is based on are the Skeptics Dictionary. We, you, you've done the readings for the stuff material on the Skeptics Dictionary. Another great source I found is an article called What's Wrong with Multi-Level Marketing by Dean Vandroff. Okay. The first uh, scheme I'm going to talk about is just this plain cash-only pyramid scheme. We want to find out what they are, what's their appeal, and what are their problems. I'd like you to remind you that these cash-only schemes are fraudulent. They're criminal. So please don't do them. I'm always worried that someday one of my students is going to try and do one, pull one of these off and somebody is going to ask him, well, how did you learn how to do this? And they're going to say, oh, Dr. Hill at Golden West taught me how. I'm teaching you this so that you don't fall victim to these schemes. Okay, the basic idea of the pyramid scheme is pretty simple, and here's a basic example. Okay, what you need is, you tell people, all you need is $100 and 10 friends who also have $100. And here's how it works, right? You're going to give me $100. Then you recruit 10 friends who each give you $100. Then each of your friend friends recruits 10 friends to give her $100 and so on ad infinitum. Okay, what does it cost, right? It costs you $100, but at the end of the thing, you've got 10 friends each giving you uh, $10 for $1,000, so you profit $900. Not bad, and you didn't have to do any work. Well, you might say, gee, Dr. Hill, okay, this is uh, interesting, but I'd like a chance to make some real money. Okay, well, here's something that's a little more complex that'll give you a chance to make some real money. Again, all you need is the same $100 and the same 10 friends. Here's how it works. Now, instead of giving me the $100, you're going to give the guy who recruited me $100. Then you're going to recruit 10 friends who each give me $100. Then each of your 10 friends will recruit 10 of their friends to give you $100. Those, were, those recruits will each recruit 10 friends to give your recruits $100 and so on ad infinitum. Okay? What that means is that you uh, got... 10 friends, each recruiting 10 people, that's 100 people each giving you uh, $100. So 100 times $100 is $10,000. It costs you 100 bucks. So you profit $9,900. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, it is. Let's see what the problem is. Okay, well, notice, before we look at the problem, though, let's take a look at the first appeal. The first appeal is uh, easy money. What it seems like, it's greed. You can rapidly get a lot of people giving you money. So that's the main now, the big problem is you run out of suckers. I mean, I mean participants very quickly. The same geometric, notice what we have there is a geometric sequence. We have a number that you're multiplying by 10 over and over again. The same geometric sequence that makes the prize look so big also means that the number of people available to pay in quickly runs out. The problem was hidden in that Latin phrase, ad infinitum. We live in a finite world, so there's no infinite source of, of suckers are to participate. Okay, here's a, here's, a, here's a diagram from the Skeptics Dictionary. If you see here, notice the person on the top level is the one person. He has to recruit 10 people. Those 10 people have to recruit 100 people who have to recruit 1,000, who have to recruit 10,000. They have to recruit 100,000, and so on, just 10 levels down from the top, and you already have 10 billion people, who have, 10 billion people involved in the scheme, and that's more people than those living on so notice, wherever the pyramid stops, the people at the bottom are going to get burned. Notice those 10 billion people at the bottom, there's nobody left for them to recruit. So if those people are smart, they're not going to buy in. They're just going to say, nobody's left for me to recruit, so they won't buy in. Well, now that we know that they won't buy in, the people at the next level, the level 9, at the ninth level, they're not going to buy in because none of those 10 billion people are available, so those 1 billion people won't buy in. And by the same reasoning, the 100,000 people, there's no million people left for them to recruit, so they won't. And you can follow the logic all the way to the top of the pyramid. So nobody, if they're smart, no one should ever buy into the pyramid. But wait a second, you might ask, wait a second, how is it the pyramid schemes can even exist? So by this reasoning, nobody should ever recruit in a pyramid scheme. Then how is it that some people actually get burned, right? You might even know somebody who's, who's gotten burned in one of these schemes. You might even know somebody who's made a little money. Was there a problem with that argument? The argument I just gave you is called a backwards induction argument. Is there a problem with that argument? Well, it's, the problem is built into that qualification that I said, if they're smart. 
If I wanted to be a little more technical, I should have said if they're smart and they also know other people to be smart. That's known as the common knowledge of rationality. That's the assumption that I act rationally and so do you, and that I know this and so do you, and I know that you know it and you know that I know it and I know that you know that I know it, etc. The problem is this is false. It's actually common knowledge that people often act irrationally. So that leads to the second appeal of the games. The second appeal is that there are bigger suckers than you. If you raise the problem of pyramid schemes running out, of the people at the bottom getting burned, your recruiter is probably going to tell you, look, we're high up on the pyramid, far away from those suckers at the bottom. Sure, they're going to get burned, right? Now, notice, it, this might actually be true. You could be up to the top of the pyramid, but... Okay. Remember that the structure of pyramids is that most of the people, just like the real stone pyramids, most of the rocks are at the bottom. In, in this, is these financial pyramids, wherever the pyramid ends, most of the people have to find themselves on the bottom. And these pyramids will not continue on to include every single person in the world. That just, that's just not going to happen. So wherever the pyramid stops, and it's bound to stop before you think about it, you're most likely to find yourself. Now, some students have said this, wait a second, can't the pyramid go on forever? Some people say, well, I made a little money in the pyramid buying in at the top. Why don't I buy in again at the bottom? Well, here's the problem. Notice that uh, at, the, at the level here of, of 10 billion people, uh, at that point, everybody in the whole planet Earth has to buy in twice. At the 11th level, every I'm assuming that for the population is about 5 billion. So that means at the 11th, uh, 11th level, everybody has to buy in 20 times. Everybody on level 12 has to buy in 200 times. There's not enough money in the world to keep this pyramid going. And furthermore, all these people are doing is they're moving money around. Nobody is farming. You know, nobody's growing food or building houses or cars or anything that make our lives better. So all they're doing is moving money around and not generating any wealth. And that's why these things are ultimately a waste of time. Now, at this point, I hope I've dissuaded you from pyramid schemes, but there are legal versions of pyramid schemes. Okay, And probably the best known is multi-level marketing, which is also known as network marketing, referral marketing. What it really is is it's a product-based pyramid scheme. So for multi-level marketing, we want to ask what they are, what's the appeal, and what's the problem. One thing I want to point out is that these multi-level marketing seems to be legal. Okay. okay, here's something that might happen. How many of you have ever been accosted by somebody? Um, and somebody says, look, I've got a great business opportunity. I'd like you to come over to my house and talk to me about that. But then when you ask them what it is, they can't explain it. Now, when you ask them what this business opportunity is, don't you think that's a fair question? Don't you think they ought to be able to tell you, hey, what, what it is, what it is you're buying, what it is you're selling, what the nature of this opportunity is? Okay, they don't want to tell you because you, when they, they don't want to tell you because obviously they're hiding something. And you probably, when you're when you're approached in this manner, you probably have the feeling in the pit of your stomach, gee, they are hiding something. Something's fishy about this. Well, it's my job now to try and explain just what the problem is. Notice a lot of people still go to this meeting. I think they may go out of social obligation. They may go out of uh, curiosity, curiosity, because maybe they think it is a great opportunity. They might also go, because people usually don't do this to their best friends, but they might do this to a friend of a friend, and they figure, oh, I might, things might get, it might get nasty with our mutual friend if I don't go to this meeting. So people sometimes go to this meeting. Now you're going to hear the pitch. Suppose you go to the meeting and hear the pitch. Your, your, your opportunity is to sell product X for full commission. <clears throat> now the product can be anything. Very often, these products have vague health claims made about it, usually not very specific. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to imagine that I'm recruiting you to, uh, to sell paper for the Michael Scott Paper Company. Notice when I say full commission, what that means, that sounds great, but it's not so good. It means you only get paid when you sell something. And if you sell nothing, you make nothing. And, and you might say, well, why would I want to do that? If I was a salesman, if I wanted to be a salesman, I'd already be a salesman. But then comes the hook. So you're going to sell the product for the full commission. Then comes the hook, and you're going to recruit other salespeople, and you're going to make a commission on everything that they sell and everything that their recruits sell. Okay, that's the hook. That's the pyramid structure. The details will vary and will typically be rather complicated. 
but you're going to be told that that's where you make the real money. You're going to make a little bit of money selling the product, paper in the case that I'm imagining here, but then you're going to make the real money by, while you're doing that, recruiting other people to sell it for you. And so you'll work for a couple of years selling the product, and then you're just going to sit back and the money is just going to roll in from other people who are selling the product. That's the now let's look at some other parts of the appeal that you'll hear if you're recruited to participate in a multi-level marketing scheme. You'll be told that you can be your own boss. We're all a bunch of independent businessmen. You can be one too and you can be your own boss. Well, let's think of for a minute if that's true. If you take this job, say with the Michael Scott Paper Company, you're going to have a whole bunch of bosses. You're going to have the person who recruited you, the person who recruited him, the per and the person who recruited her, people who are known in multi-level marketing parlance as your upline. They're going to be your bosses, as well as, of course, the Michael, as Michael Scott himself. Or whatever organization it is, you're going to be taking a sales rep, selling their product, and, you're, and they're going to be your boss. bosses. So you won't really be your own boss. You're going to have to play, sell their product, play their game by their rules. Another thing you might be told is we eliminate the middlemen, and that's why we're able to save our customers so much money. Well, let's think about a real business that has real middlemen, so let's think about apples. Apples are often grown in Washington State, but you can go into a grocery store anywhere here in California, and you can buy beautiful apples pretty cheaply. And the reason you have is because there's a middleman. Somebody trucked those apples from Washington to California, and that middleman has to be paid. Okay? Well, notice that, you're, that the shipper is not a middleman that you're eliminating, eliminating in a multi-level marketing scheme. You're going to be selling a product out of boxes in your garage, and somebody's going to ship them to you, probably the post office, UPS, or another delivery company. So those middlemen are still, are still there, and they still have to get paid. But in multi-level marketing, there's a whole other catalog, category of middlemen, and that is your upline. That is the person who recruited you and so forth. All of those people have to be paid based on the product that you're selling. But let me ask you a question. How much value has your upline provided to the consumer? I'm going to give you a hint. It's a round number. Okay. But you can see that even though this upline has added no value to the consumer, they still have to get paid significantly. And that's one reason why products sold through multi-level marketing are so expensive. Here's another thing they're liable to tell you. They're liable to tell you that anybody can do this. Just get with the program, uh, you know, work hard for a few years, and sit back, and the money's going to roll in. Now, I want you to hold on to that part of the appeal because we're going to see that's actually not true. Most people involved make little or no money. Uh, but when you raise that with them, they're going to they're going to tell you something that the pitch is going to change, as we'll, as we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, so you know, as you can see, that none of these parts of the appeal are true. I'd also like to ask you if I've missed any parts of the pitch. If there's any other parts of the multi-level marketing pitch that I've missed in this presentation, I, I invite you to let us know by posting them in the comments section below. But the big problem that you're going to run into with multi-level marketing is market saturation. Here's the, here are the simple facts. No matter what the product is, the market for it is finite. Okay? And no matter what this product is, whether it's Michael Scott paper, not everyone will want to buy it. Okay? Some people will prefer a cheaper product. Some people will prefer a more expensive product. And finally, I have a shocking fact about people's buying preferences. I'd like you to sit down before I read this one to you. Okay, you ready? Here it is. Here's the shocking fact. Believe it or not, some people actually enjoy shopping in stores. I know, it's hard to believe, it certainly doesn't apply to me, but a lot of people like going into a store, they like seeing the products attractively displayed in stores, and these people are not going to want to buy the product out of cardboard boxes in your garage. Notice that another thing that you're supposed to do with multi-level marketing, you're supposed to recruit your friends and neighbors. But if you think about it, when you do that, then they become your competitors. Your friends and neighbors know the same people that you do, so they're going to try to sell to the same people that you would be selling to. Uh, it's like this. Would you buy a McDonald's franchise if McDonald's wanted to put co competing franchises on the three corners opposite you? I don't think so, right? A McDonald's franchise can make a lot of money, but if they put competing franchises, you wouldn't have a chance to make any money. Notice that multi-level marketing uh, schemes have an open agenda. Let's also consider a car dealership. They've done a little study, and they decide the optimum number of people they need to sell cars is 10 salespeople. That's the number of people that need to work their lot. Would they be better off hiring than hiring 100 salespeople? Well, let's consider some of the disadvantages. If they need 10 salespeople, 
uh, and they have 100, pe 100 salespeople, here's what's going to happen. As soon as any one person steps onto the lot, he's going to be accosted by a bunch of bored and uh, poor car salesmen who aren't making much money, and that's not going to engender a lot of confidence in the cars that are being sold. People might find this sales experience so unpleasant that they want to go somewhere else to buy a car. I cannot think of any advantages to hiring uh, 10 times as many salespeople as you need. So if the car sales, so if the car dealership decides that they need 10 salespeople and they have 100 applicants, they're going to pick the 10 best applicants, and to the other 90 people are going to say, well, good luck, but we can't hire you. That is that when a legitimate business has enough salespeople, they stop hiring salespeople. Common sense, right? But notice that multi-level marketing outfits cannot do this. Okay, the reason is because everybody bought in so that they could recruit other salespeople. That is the people who were known as their downline. As a result, most people involved in multi-level marketing schemes make very little. Now, here's an interesting thing about multi-level marketing. Many customers find it difficult to buy the multi-level marketing product, the paper in the case that I'm imagining for you here. Here's why. Let's suppose, for example, you need paper, right? You need some paper, and your friend is selling it through multi-level marketing, and you want to help your friend, right? You're not crazy about, about the scheme. You have your doubts about it, but you still want to support your friend. You still might find it difficult to buy it from her, and here's why. The, the multi-level marketing sales reps are selling two things. They're selling the product, but they're also selling the dream. When you're someone who buys the product, people who buy into this suddenly find out that they're having a harder time Find, they're having a harder time moving this product, they're having, especially they're having a harder time recruiting other salespeople than they imagined. It seems such a great idea to them, they're probably having a difficult time seeing why other people can't see that this would be such a great, a great deal for them to buy into. So when, when, as somebody who likes the product, she says, might say, hey, you like the product, you could sell the product. So every time you buy the product, you get the whole pitch to become a sales rep, which you don't want. You just want paper because you need to print something. Okay. Now, here's a question. We talked about pyramid schemes a few minutes ago. How are multi-level marketing schemes like the plain cash-only pyramid schemes? Well, they both the math is similar. They both have the appeal of a geometric sequence of seemingly getting a large number of people making money for you. And, but for the same reason, you rapidly run out of sales representatives. There's just not enough people. Okay, they're di here's how they're different than plain pyramid schemes. The big difference is that a product is sold, although in most cases it's just sold to the distributors themselves. People end up buying the product themselves, making very little money. Uh, but the buying and the selling obscures the pyramid structure, so the legality is questionable. People who are in multi-level market, multi people, so because of that, multi-level marketing seems to be legal pyramid schemes. Okay, the courts have, have they been people who are running these schemes have been accused of uh, of running illegal schemes, but they've generally been able to hire good lawyers and get acquitted. So multi-level marketing schemes seem to be legal pyramid schemes, and it, so so. But I think the tragic fact is that people will often stick with a multi-level marketing scheme for years and then blame themselves when it fails. This what Dean Vandruff calls the pyramid within the pyramid. Okay? Raise this issue if you can, and you're likely to hear it, yeah, sure. Okay, some sales reps are you losers, but not you. You're a quality person. I can see that you've got what it takes. All you need to do is buy these motivational materials. Okay, back in the old days, these were tapes, you know, cassette tapes and videotapes. Um, I'm sure there's CDs, DVDs, and audio downloads now, but it, what especially is there is there are meetings, meetings, and more meetings. Okay. And these motivational materials are often sold through a pyramid scheme, and you may not know how much your upline is making from selling you these motivational materials. You might be told, get in on the ground floor. Well, the translation of that is, well, you're higher up in the pyramid, or that there are than you. Now, if you buy in, let me tell you what you're going to have to do. At the very first, at least, you're going to have to mislead or outright lie to your prospects. Okay. I want you to notice how they, if you've been recruited, and you probably have for one of these schemes, because these schemes are so common, uh, notice how vague the, vague the claims have been from those who have tried to recruit you. When you're asking them how much money they've made, I bet they haven't given you a number. I bet they say, well, I've never seen anything sell like this. Well, if people have never sold before, they probably, that's true, even if they've only sold one thing or even if they haven't sold anything at all.
Okay, and notice another thing is that anyone that you do recruit is going to be one step closer to the bottom than you and look at how much trouble you've been having. They're going to have even more trouble recruiting people than you've been having. That's what you're wishing on them if you try to recruit. Now, the last variation of a pyramid scheme that I'm going to talk about is the Ponzi scheme. Okay, the Ponzi scheme is an investment scheme in which money from later investors is used to pay off early investors. Well, so you might think, wait a second, if you're running a con, why not keep all the money, right? That's, that's the thing. Well, notice, um, here's, you want to keep all the money. Well, one thing is if, if, if you pay off, paying off the initial investors increases their confidence in the scheme, thus it's a confidence game or a con. What that does is that leads them to encourage other investors to invest their money and for the initial investors who have been repaid off to invest more of their own money. So they might even put back the money that you have. Now, two famous, there are two, the two most famous examples of, of Ponzi schemers are Charles Ponzi and Bernie Madoff. Charles Ponzi in 1990, Charles Ponzi was an Italian immigrant in Boston. In 1919, he promised people a 50% return in 45 days. Now that's an, a, approximately a 2,500% annual return rate, which is amazing, right? Which is unbelievable, should have given his, his investors a clue. Now he claimed to be trading in postal reply coupons. Apparently, this was a kind of international postage. Apparently, you know, they sold for like one cent in Europe and four cents in America. So he claimed to be buying them in Europe and selling them in America. Okay. Um, but that was just a cover story. You might think, well, you could make money doing that. But the thing is, if you're making millions of dollars handling little pieces of paper with, before the ages of computers, it might be kind of difficult. But they're, they're, these postal world coupons, he didn't have them. This was just a cover story. Charles Ponzi got caught, went to prison, and gave his name to the scam. A more recent uh, a version of the Ponzi scheme came from Bernie Madoff. Now, Bernie Madoff's Ponzi was also an affinity scam. Bernie Madoff worked to be seen as a pillar of the Jewish community and got a lot of people from that community to invest in him, to trust him and invest in him because he seemed to have something in common with him. Now, one of the more interesting subtle features of Bernie Madoff's scheme is that he didn't get this unbelievable return rate of, that Ponzi had, this 2,500% return rate. Uh, some of his people said, if I'd, I'd never have believed a return rate that. Instead of that unbelievably high return rate, he promised his investors an unbelievably safe and steady rate of return. That is, if you invest in stocks, sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down. But for, for Madoff's investors, when the, when the market was a good year and everybody made money, on paper his investors seemed to make money also. But when the, when the stock market had a bad year and most investors seemed to lose money, his investors still seemed to make a little money. And that was fine um, as long as the people were, were content with the money that was on paper that they didn't want to take their money out of the fund. As a result, Bernie Madoff's scam lasted much longer than Charles Ponzi, Ponzi's, but Madoff also now, let's take a look at a question. How is a Ponzi scheme like a plain pyramid scheme? Well, notice they both, there's both of an emphasis on recruiting, and in both cases, the early winners bring in the later losers. Finally, the scheme inevitably collapses as it runs out of profits. Now, let's look at how a Ponzi scheme is different than a cash-only pyramid scheme. A cover story hides the pyramid structure. Okay, remember, in a plain old cash-only pyramid scheme, the, the pyramid structure is part of the appeal. In multi-level marketing, the pyramid structure is obscured by all this buying and selling. In a Ponzi scheme, there's some lie that's being told about how the, how the money is being generated. In a Ponzi scheme, the early winners often reinvest and become the later losers themselves. In a cash-only pyramid scheme, uh, you know that if you don't bring in another sucker that, that you're going to lose your money. Okay, But in a uh, Ponzi scheme, you think that the investment is real, so you might put your own money back in. And furthermore, the scheme, in, in a typical Ponzi scheme, the schemer typically absconds with the money before the inevitable collapse of the fund. But not Charles Ponzi or Bernie Madoff, and that's why they're the most famous ones. That's why Charles Ponzi gave his name to the fund, and that's why Bernie Madoff is so well known, because they... Now, here's the big question. Is Social Security a Ponzi scheme? It often is being said, well, the answer is tricky. It depends on what Social Security really is. Let's recall our definition of a Ponzi scheme. It's an investment scheme in which money from later investors is used to pay off early investors. Now, Social Security really does work that way. Okay, The money that we're paying in now, 
right? The initial people to, to get Social Security didn't pay much in. Uh, the money that we're paying in now goes to pay out the people who are collecting now. So if Social Security is an investment scheme, well, then yes, it is a Ponzi scheme. Okay? Notice that Social Security is typically sold as an investment scheme, and people who've paid in typically feel entitled to be paid. But maybe not. Maybe it's really not a Ponzi scheme, because perhaps Social Security is not really an investment plan. Maybe what it really is, is it's a social program whereby the young take care of the old. Okay? Notice that every society needs something like this. I mean, traditionally, it was your children who took care of you when you were older. Okay? But every society needs something like this, and maybe Social Security is simply the way that modern American society does this. In that case, it's not a Ponzi scheme, but if that's so, we'd better stop talking about Social Security as an entitlement. That is something we're entitled to because we paid, and it's a, it's a social program that we're using to, to, to support the old and keep them out of poverty, and that's how we should. Now, there are other scams. But the ones I've talked about here are common, so I want to, I hope that you can avoid them to save money and avoid heartache.